Um, so I'm here to talk to you about rethinking schools. So building on um, what Shu and Andrew have just talked about, um, um, using schools as community hubs and really opening them up um, in our cities as places where people can gather um, and really utilise the land uh, more efficiently. So I'm from the Architectus um, Urban Planning and Design Team, um, but we're an integrated architecture, um, urban design and planning group um, that operates across Australia and New Zealand. Um, we work um, quite extensively as well in the Southeast Asia region as well. Um, but where this kind of sits is we've been doing a bit of research over the last 12, 12 to 18 months on in our centres on how schools can really be used um, as community hubs and how we can more efficiently use um, funds to, to make sure we're not duplicating on community facilities and that government funds and, and, um, and economies are being used um, in a more efficient way. So, you know, a culmination of all of this is there's a real public benefit to rethinking the way that we utilise um, traditional school campuses um, and even rethink how we design um, traditional campuses and remodel them um, for denser environments. So I'll just give you a bit of a context as to um, you know, what we're working with in Sydney. Um, this is also happening in other Australian cities. Um, we saw in Melbourne, um, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane, um, they're also all rethinking how schools can be used. Um, we'll have a quick look at the current school campus model um, and also how education is delivered at the moment. Um, what vertical schools can offer and the benefits of that and then some conclusions and recommendations that we've come up with. So as a bit of context, um, in Sydney, as you know, we're looking at a population of about 8 million people in the coming, um, in the next 40 years. That means over the next 20 years, building 700 to 800,000 new dwellings. Um, within A lot of that within our existing urban footprint. We don't have too much room to grow um, out. We're going upwards. Um, and what that means is there's increased pressure on our existing open space and our social infrastructure. So as our centres are getting more dense, um, the ability to find land to, to utilise for open space and infrastructure is becoming more and more limited. Traditionally, we've used the old 2.83 hectares um, of open space per 1,000 people. Um, and today, we're also going towards a model that looks at size and quality of open space. So as our cities grow, there's, um, as our population grows, there's increased pressure to provide this level of, of open space. So in Sydney, we've kind of got three rings that define the city. There's the inner ring, which is um, from the city and maybe five to 10 kilometres out. Um, from 10 to 25 kilometres um, out of the city, we've got the middle ring, and then you've got the outer ring, which is um, everything that's 25 kilometres um, and further. And what you can see is there's a huge, um, discrepancy in terms of the amount of open space provided um, in those areas. So in the inner ring, um, you're at about 1.65 hectares per 1,000 people in terms of open space. In the middle ring, 1.99 hectares, and in the outer ring, 6.32, where you've got lots of national parks and regional open spaces. So you can see in the inner and middle ring, there's already a lot of pressure um, on open space and on community facilities. Um, it's already underprovided. And these are the areas where population is growing significantly. The second problem we're dealing with is um, decreasing affordability of land. So over the last 20 or 30 years, there's been an increase in the borrowing capacity um, of, of people and they've been investing and buying in property. We've had coupled, that, coupled with that is strong population growth um, and then also a slow response to actually getting dwellings um, onto the market. So what that means is we're pricing out um, you know, future school land and we're also pricing out the ability of um, government and councils to actually purchase land to use for community facilities. Our third problem in Sydney um, is we do have a great east-west divide in terms of advantage and disadvantage. On the eastern side of the city, um, where we've got relative advantage, um, we're seeing much lesser rates of population growth compared to our Western centres, um, where you're getting population growth of 40 to 90%. So there's a huge um, discrepancy there between East and West. And what that means, we're putting more people um, in more relatively disadvantaged locations, um, and there's an increased need to really think about how we 
find solutions to providing community infrastructure and open space. So the current school campus, um, yeah, there's been lots of new things happening in that space, um, as Shu and Andrew touched on, but schools traditionally are still only open from 8 till 5 p.m., generally 9 till 3, and there's some um, before and after school activities that might be in use. During the week, um, they're Monday or Friday um, places, and over the year, they're only operating for nine of the 12 months. So if you add up all of that, schools are only re really being used for 50% of the time. So there's half the time that they could be used for other things. I've got an aerial shot here of, um, of a centre. Um, it's Punchbowl. It's about 20 kilometres out of the CBD. And this centre is about to have um, a Sydney Metro station delivered. Um, and you can see in the centre there the, the railway station. But from the area, what you can see is it's an existing low density centre and there really isn't much in terms of um, tall buildings. You've got some three or four storey residential flat buildings. But over the next 15 to 20 years, this centre is going to transform into a high density suburb where you're going to see apartments um, up to 25 storeys um, tall. And from what you can see there, there really isn't much space to provide new social infrastructure or new open space. There's a big parcel of open space there, but that's currently fenced off by a 2.4 metre high um, fence. Um, and it's part of the school that sits adjacent to that. Um, and that really is the traditional suburban school model in Sydney. And the reason and the barriers why, of why some of these schools aren't being opened up is there's concerns about security and access control. So schools really want to control who is on their site. Um, and their, their key concern really is child protection and making sure that that isn't compromised. Um, but these days with things like smartphones, there really is the technology to rethink how we secure schools and how we control access and know who is on the school campus. There's also issues of liability. So who is responsible if somebody trips over on, on a school site? And if we do open, up, open them up to the public, um, are the schools then liable for um, more than what they, they bargain for? Um, in terms of funding, there's if you do increase the use of schools, there's then the issue of who pays for maintenance and who pays for upgrades of schools. Um, and then you've got an in inconsistent policy framework. So as part of our research, we looked at the three key education providers in New South Wales, and they are the public sector, um, the Catholic school sector, and the independent sector. And each of those have a whole range of policies that control who can actually access their site and how, how a site can actually be used by the public. So it just adds to the complex um, nature of opening up school sites. But all of that leads to a case um, for vertical schools and on our suburban campuses and really remodeling how, how we think of the school and how we perceive it, um, but also how we redesign these schools as the population grows. Schools can offer a whole range of public benefits. So they offer multi-purpose spaces, they offer specialist teaching areas, they offer performance space and community facilities, um, open space and active recreational space. So there's a whole range of opportunities um, for using schools as community infrastructure. And often what you see is a school will provide one piece of infrastructure that's then duplicated down the road by local or state government because the school really isn't part of the, the community fabric and the urban fabric of a centre. We looked at another centre just uh, west of Punchbowl, Bankstown, um, and the plan for that suburb's growth was to provide new infrastructure uh, for the community and new open spaces. Uh, that centre will see you know, 10 or 15,000 new residents in the coming 20 years. And there's seven schools in that centre and none of those um, figured in the plan that was released by state government. Those seven schools, um, you've got two government schools, three Catholic schools, and two independent schools. And all of those can readily, um, and today, meet the needs of the growing population. So some of the visions are providing open space, and three of those schools have open space that can readily be um, opened up to the public without even remodeling that, those campuses. Um, providing district and regional community facilities, again, all of the seven schools um, could provide facilities that then contribute to, to that centre. Um, providing facilities um, highly accessible to the train station. You've got three schools within a five-minute walk of that station. 
um, again, not really factored into, into the planning process for growth. Um, other things, so developing large multi-purpose district community centres, again, the schools readily offer those facilities, um, library facilities, um, arts facilities, all of these are um, already built into the school. So there's an argument to, to really think about our, our school campuses and what they can offer. And then as the population grows, how we remodel them. Um, architects were entrants in the design competition for the Arthur Phillip High School. And as Andrew um, talked about, it was really about taking that traditional suburban school into a stacked vertical school model um, and opening up um, the school as much as possible to the public. So one of our concepts was having a podium that was open um, to the public, and that's where you had community access outside of hours, but you could still secure the learning spaces in the tower above. So vertical campuses, whilst they're, they're new with some exceptions um, in Australia, they are commonplace in other world cities. Um, we're seeing them, um, as Sue said, in New York um, and Hong Kong, where we're seeing them either integrated in mixed-use buildings um, or a standalone high-rise vertical campuses like um, the Canadian International School in Hong Kong. Um, but what we are seeing um, is also a shift in, in other types of education. Um, recently in Parramatta, which you've all heard about, um, Architectus designed and, and delivered the One Parramatta Square um, University campus for the Western Sydney University. And that's a mixed-use commercial building with 10,000 students um, in the law and business schools. And that's been quite successful in terms of engaging the broader community. So people can go in there and have meetings. Um, it, there's Wi-Fi that can be accessed by the public. There's cafes and restaurants downstairs. So it's quite an active community hub. So applying that model um, on, on our suburban campuses, especially when they're near centres and um, experiencing high population growth, can really contribute to the success of a centre. In terms of economic efficiencies, um, re remodelling our campuses makes sense in, in terms of how we fund community infrastructure and also how we fund schools. So at the moment, community facilities are funded by developer contributions where you've got value capture opportunities or, and, and contributions, um, local government budgets um, and grants from state and Commonwealth government. For schools, um, funding comes from school fees um, for non-government schools and then uh, state government funding, Commonwealth funding and, and other fundraising activities. So you can imagine there creating synergies between those funding channels and applying that to a school campus where council or, or government don't need to provide duplicate facilities. They can pool funds um, and utilise schools more efficiently. So out of that, um, we've got three key recommendations. So the first of those is in our strategic planning process, really thinking about what value schools can add um, to a centre. So when we're planning centres for growth, um, particularly in, in, Australian, in the Australian city context, we need to be thinking about the facilities schools can offer and making sure that we don't actually duplicate those facilities. So we're taking advantage of those and really making the school a community hub. Um, schools are often highly accessible. They're within lots of times within walking distances of their catchments, particularly primary schools. So there's huge opportunity there in, in remodeling those and really making them fit for you know, um, a community of another few thousand people. Um, the second recommendation is working across disciplines, so educators, planners, architects, um, and, and government working together to establish one framework that will allow schools to be opened up to the public. Um, we're still seeing this happening, happen on an ad hoc, uh, in an ad hoc way. So, um, for example, the local government of Parramatta only recently signed an MOU with the Department of Education to utilise some limited school facilities across their local government area um, for, for the public. Um, in other areas, you know, the non-government sector have a whole range of um, of checks that need to be undertaken before somebody can actually access their site. Um, and in some suburbs of Sydney, you're seeing tensions between the local community not wanting to open up school sites because of perceived um, issues like traffic um, and weekend um, busyness that might impact on them. Finally, um, we currently have the technology to really 
<coughs> know who's on site and how you know, control access to sites. We all have, you know, these days most people have smartphones um, and there's the technology there to allow um, the people that run schools to know who is on their site and to allow people to see the terms and conditions um, and the liabilities involved with accessing a school site. So there's really the opportunity to harness the use of technology um, to make schools more available and really promote the awareness um, that school facilities are available. So in planning our cities, um, no matter what our discipline, we really need to put schools at the forefront of um, creating community hubs. And we're, we still have a long way to go um, in, in, Australia, in the Australian context. Um, as Andrew said, schools are still seen as places that really need to be secure. Um, and really separate to the public. So models like the Arthur Phillip High School where you are um, designing for the integration of the public and schools is really the way forward um, as our cities grow. Thank you.